So welcome everyone. I'm Hannah. I'm the assistant director at the Blue Hill Library. And I wanted to thank everyone for joining us this evening. Um, we're very excited to have Tom Ricks speaking with us again. I was just remembering with him uh, a few years ago when he was here for his book, Churchill and Orwell, we had people crowded into the main room of the library. So things look a little different tonight, but we're so pleased that he was still able to join us virtually and uh, share from his new book, First Principles. Um, Tom, of course, is uh, playing to the hometown crowd here tonight. He's based on Deer Isle but he's also um, covered the US military for the Washington Post, as well as writing for the Wall Street Journal. And he's written several books uh, in addition to the two that I have named. Also wanna give a shout out to Blue Hill Books. Um, they've got signed copies of Tom's latest book available at the store. So give them a call and support our local bookstore. I believe they're still shipping uh, anywhere. If you want, if you're not here right now locally and you wanna, uh, support the store, you can still purchase from them. And yeah, I'm going to hand it over to Tom and he'll speak for a while. And then when we are ready for questions, um, we're just going to ask folks to use the chat feature on Zoom to type your questions in and I'll read those out. So we will <clears throat> we'll have time for Q&A at the end. Um, so you can think of your questions and, and jot them down. But for now, I'll hand it over to Tom. Please welcome Tom. <laughs> Thank you, Hannah. Um, First, I want to just take a second to talk about the Blue Hill Library. Uh, I think library is always important, but I think few libraries are as important as libraries in Maine during the winter time. And I think it was, I'm, I'm really moved at the effort that Blue Hill Library has made to stay open, to be, enable people to keep getting books. Uh, I really don't think my wife and I would be able to make it through the winter here without the libraries we have around here. So I'd like to begin by just asking that you give them a round of applause. Uh, about my new book, it's called First Principles. Much to my surprise, it's done very well. Uh, it's uh, last week was number four on the New York Times bestsellers list. And I didn't think that a book about a fairly obscure subject, the influence of ancient Roman Greece on the people who won the American Revolution and then designed the country would be that interesting to that many people. But here I've got to thank my editor. He said, no, right after the election, people are going to want to go back to fundamentals, to first principles. How did this country get uh, from there to here? What was the intention? Uh, what is this house that we live in? And so that's what I tried to write about. I figured I'd talk now for about 20 minutes and then get to your questions, which I think is always the more interesting part of this type of event. But I'll give you kind of an overview of the book and just maybe plant a few seeds for questions. Uh, Rome and Greece and the founders is a subject that we're not really taught well in high school or college, partly because it's all around us, but we don't see it. If you look at the Capitol building, that word capital comes from Rome. The US Senate is an imitation of the Roman Senate. Take out a dollar bill out of your wallet and you will see Latin on both sides of it. Um, look at the towns that were founded in the late 18th century and early 19th century, especially for some reason, upstate New York, Utica, Troy. Again and again, these names are about 25 towns up there, Ithaca, that all have names that come from the classical world. Our, our, our political parties, Democrat is Greek, Republican is Latin in its origin. They are that way because Greece and Rome were so important to the people who invented this country. Why? Well, when they just started designing this country, there weren't a whole lot of examples that they wanted to use. Most governments, most of the time, had been monarchies of one sort or another, kings, queens, emperors. There were a few republics, and the ones they looked to were a couple of Greek city-states, but primarily the Roman Republic. That is Rome before the takeover uh, by Julius Caesar and the, event, the rise of the emperors. <clears throat> 
to them, the fall of the Roman Republic with people like Cicero, Cato, uh, Julius Caesar himself, had the urgency of front page news. They were desperately looking around, how do you design a government that doesn't have a king? And also, how do you avoid the mistakes the Romans made that led to the fall of the Roman Republic? These things were urgent to them. They also were really the only political vocabulary they had, and also it was the heroes they had. You didn't have movie stars then, you didn't have sports stars, uh, but you had Cato and Cicero and Cincinnatus and other Roman figures. And this is who they talked about. These were role models for them. These were the people they tried to emulate. Uh, different ones for different people. George Washington, for example, particularly liked the image of Cato. Cato uh, is a Roman politician, a statesman opposed to the rise of Julius Caesar. Cato is frugal, prudent, wise, just, and reserved. And these are things that George Washington very consciously tried to emulate as he rose up in society. Uh, for John Adams, it was Cicero. Thomas Jefferson, always a little bit different than the others, is more Greek than Roman. And in fact, looking at Greece, Jefferson prefers Athens to Sparta, which is a shocking choice in his day. Samuel Adams, another revolutionary, said he hoped that Sparta, the uh, Greek city-state, uh, would be the model for Boston. I don't think there's been a city less like Sparta than Boston, Massachusetts. But that was his hope at the time. But one reason today that each state in the United States has two senators, Wyoming with a tiny population of 500,000 and California with a huge population of I think something like 25 million. They both have two senators because that's the way the Amphitonic League, a word I have problems with, uh, this league of ancient Greek city-states kind of like a little bit of a ancient Greek version of NATO. Each city-state, no matter how big or small, had two votes. And so when these guys were making up the country at the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia, they went with those two votes, whether you're big or small. The key question for them was what brought down the Roman Republic? And they said two things, factionalism and corruption. To them, factionalism meant dividing into partisan groups, into political parties. And so the older ones, especially uh, George Washington and John Adams, saw factionalism as tantamount to treason. So for example, when John Adams becomes president following George Washington, he decides that anybody who criticizes the president should be thrown in jail. And he starts throwing newspaper editors in jail because that's factionalism. Factionalism could bring down the whole republic. And so it's like treason. Uh, that was his view. He was a disaster as a president. By the way, he was our first one-term president. He was quite bitter about being voted out uh, in 1800 and uh, really didn't like the idea of turning power over to Thomas Jefferson, but he did. We had the first transfer of power in this country to the political opposition. There's a saying among political scientists that anybody can elect a president. The real test of a democracy is whether you can have an election in which the opposition wins and gains power. And we have someone in the White House right now who still hasn't taken that completely on board. By the way, John Adams wasn't very nice about some of his transition to Thomas Jefferson. He made a bunch of last minute appointments that really angered Jefferson. And he declined to attend Jefferson's inaugural in March, 1801. Instead, he caught the 4 a.m. coach to Baltimore and got out of town. Nonetheless, I have a lot of problems with John Adams, but he turned over power to the opposition, a great precedent and very important in our history. Adams was freaked out by factionalism. And by the way, I think John Adams' reputation has been enormous in recent years, uh, first by the David McCullough biography, and then by that HBO miniseries, uh, in which Paul Giamatti played John Adams as kind of this 
cuddly teddy bear. Um, I think John Adams is a lot more like the Woody Allen of his day than um, he is like Paul Giamatti. Jefferson was not as bothered by faction. He and Madison start developing political parties in the 1790s, inventing the opposition. Jefferson, as I said, was more a Greek than a Roman. Uh, he was not a Stoic, the Greek philosophy um, embodied by Cato. He was more of an Epicurean, uh, a follower of the Greek philosopher Epicurus, who was all about the prudent pursuit of happiness and the prudent avoidance of pain. And actually, if you go back and read the Declaration of Independence, it strikes me as a very Epicurean document. Twice in the first couple of paragraphs, it talks about human happiness, the pursuit of happiness. Madison, the fourth of the people I write about, is almost a new generation. Uh, just as I came to kind of have problems with Adams and Jefferson as I was writing about them, I really came to admire Washington and Madison. There's a saying among American historians, the more you know about George Washington, the more you admire him. And I think the same is true of James Madison. To me, he is the second most important founder after Washington. Washington won the war that gave us the country, but Madison is the most important person in designing the country and figuring out, okay, what is this thing going to be? Uh, Madison, interestingly, is also more steeped in the classics than anybody else. He spends years before the Constitutional Convention studying ancient Greek and Roman history with the eye of a political scientist. Why don't republics last? How can we have a sustainable republic? Is corruption the problem? Is it true, as the French philosopher Montesquieu says, that you can't have a big republic, that republics have to be city-states? Well, Madison is thinking we're gonna have a big nation, we better figure out how to have a big republic. So Madison, during the Articles of Confederation time, the 1780s, says this thing isn't working, it's Articles of Confederation. There's no effective central government. Each state is more or less on its own, not unlike the last year for us in living with the virus. The, no central response, no coordination. The governor is all trying to figure it out by themselves. Madison says, we gotta get away from this Articles of Confederation. He leads the, uh, leads the charge to have a constitutional convention. He's the first guy to show up in Philadelphia for it. He gives one of the first and most important speeches laying out his research. Everybody's very impressed. They say this guy really knows what he's talking about. And then after the constitutional convention, he leads the campaign for ratification along with Alexander Hamilton. Because each state has to ratify it. And it was kind of a near run thing. Uh, Massachusetts originally was thought to be expected to oppose the constitution, had a long discussion and argument, but finally approved it. When that happened, Virginia went along. Finally, New York very narrowly went along with the ratification. And then for his last great act, Jimmy Madison and Tom, Thomas Jefferson basically invent American politics in the 1790s with the rise of an opposition party. And I'm so impressed by Madison, in part because you wouldn't expect this guy to play such a role. He's small, maybe five foot, five foot one, weighs about 110, 115 pounds. Uh, he has a terrible speaking voice. In fact, even though he's a prominent thinker at Princeton where he went to college, uh, he is excused from giving a speech at the graduation ceremonies because he is such a lousy speaker. And he suffered from some form of epilepsy, so we don't know quite what. Despite all this, he becomes a key figure in designing the country we live in now. Okay, um, the country they designed had one great flaw that we have to talk about, and it's important, and that was slavery. The founders, wrote slavery into the constitution, the fundamental law of the land. Now we know why they did this. The delegations from South Carolina and Georgia said at the constitutional convention, 
that if you people put a whiff of getting rid of slavery into the Constitution, we will walk. And Georgia and South Carolina will stand outside this new country. And that's significant because they weren't big states, but if they were outside the United States, it could give European powers, France, England, Spain, a toehold on the continent from which to oppose the United States. So it wasn't just losing these two states, it was the prospect of having foreign intervention on your doorstep that really concerned the people who wrote the Constitution. Nonetheless, they write it in. Slavery is not a stain on the American fabric, it is woven into the American fabric. And 250 years later, we are still pulling out those strands of slavery, that yarn of slavery. And there are still people in this country who don't think that black people deserve first-class citizenship. And unfortunately, some of those people wear police uniforms. So we are still living with some of the problems that the founders passed on to us. This is important also because they looked to the ancient world and they said the ancient world had slavery. In fact, Aristotle talks about it and says slavery is acceptable. The important distinction is that in the ancient world, slavery was not race-based. In America, it was. Uh, American slavery, according to most experts, also was far crueler, far harsher than Roman and Greek slavery tended to be, with the exception of Sparta, which was terrifically harsh on its slaves. For example, slaves had the right to petition the emperor if they felt they were abused, and the children of freed slaves could hold public office, something that has taken America a long time to get around to making sure happens. If the founders came back today, I think they would be pleased by one thing, embarrassed by a second thing, and shocked by a third thing. They would be pleased to see that this country is resilient, that the country they designed has lasted for more than 250 years. Uh, remember, this was one of Madison, Madison's prime aims. How do we make a sustainable republic? And they'd say, look, the machinery still works. Yes, it has some flaws. It has some problems. But remember, they would say, we wrote it to be changed, to be amended. And you have amendment after amendment. I think, in fact, they would fall to us and say, in early America, the Constitution was amended frequently in major ways. Nowadays, in the last 100 years, you people aren't amending it so much. So if you have complaints about the Constitution, change it. The second things I think they would be embarrassed by is how much of a problem slavery proved to be in this country, leading to a great civil war and then to reconstruction. And I, I think we're, we are still living in post-civil war reconstruction in this country. The third thing I think that is they would be shocked by is the role that money plays in politics nowadays. Now money has always played a role in politics, but it's never been as important in American politics as it is now. I would say the dollar is more, more important than the vote. And I think most of the founders, not all of them, but most of them would say, you are in danger of losing your democracy and it becoming more an oligarchy. An oligarchy being, of course, ruled by the rich, for the rich and of the rich. I think they would say, you need to do something about the role of corporations. And I think Jefferson and Madison especially would be upset by the role that Wall Street plays in politics. I don't agree with a lot of what Bernie Sanders says, but I think one thing he's right about is that nowadays Congress doesn't regulate Wall Street, Wall Street regulates Congress. I think the founders finally looking at our country today would be really bothered by the federal government's handling of the virus of COVID. They would point to a phrase that occurs in the constitution not once, but twice. And that's the phrase, the general welfare. This means the public good. Public good could be things like the environment, a transportation infrastructure. It can be uh, public safety. And 
this year especially, it could mean public health. In fact, uh, there's a saying in, in ancient Roman history that government begins with public health. And this year, our government fell down terribly on public health. So I think they would remind us, pay attention to the general welfare. And they would also say, don't make the market the judge of everything. There are some things that should be above the market. Uh, the market should not govern healthcare. We're the only major industrialized country that has this huge, ineffective, for-profit healthcare sector. And I think they would say, you have lost hold on a first principle there. P the public health should come before profit. Those are my thoughts. Please fire your questions in. Uh, and I'm gonna leave it to Hannah to decide how we go about it, or I can just rattle on more. Uh, I've just got one request. When you ask me questions, don't be too polite. I was a reporter for 25 years. I developed a thick skin. And if I can take uh, harsh responses from Donald Rumsfeld, I can take them from you. So fire away. All right, a challenge. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. Um, so yeah, if people have questions, feel free to start writing them in the chat now and I'll just scroll through. Um, we do have one that Butler asked earlier. Um, how and when do you think we got off the rails from what some might call Jeffersonian principles or has it been an off thing for years? It's a good question. I would say two almost paradoxical things. This country has always been a rough and rowdy and rambunctious country. Uh, when people ask me about social media these days being disruptive, I would say it's not nearly as disruptive as political newspapers were in the 1790s. Political newspapers, there have always been newspapers, been long been newspapers, but they were basically shipping news, uh, sort of business news, kind of like the Wall Street Journal is today. In the 1790s, political newspapers start emerging. And it's very disruptive to American politics. John Adams thinks it's a terrible trend and he thinks it will lead to the destruction of the Republic. Now, Adams was right, it was destabilizing, but stability is not the prime job of the American government. The prime job of the American government is to be responsive to the people who own it, we the people. And so change is not necessarily bad, even destabilizing change is not bad. Um, so I think, first of all, this country has always been rowdy, has always gone through terrific change. Uh, where I think the country, to use your phrase, has ha gone off the rails, uh, I think terribly with the Citizens United decision uh, and the preceding decisions that said corporations are people, Citizens United says corporations have all the rights of free speech that people have. I think we need to make a distinction between we the people and corporations and other, and other associations of people. Corporations are not mentioned in the constitution. They are not privileged in the constitution. That is the decision that a Supreme Court made later. I think the Supreme Court has made some terrible decisions. Uh, the Dred Scott decision that said black people, free or not, have no rights that white people have to respect. Uh, Plessy v. Ferguson that said segregation is just fine. And Citizens United that said the corporations can play an active role in politics. I think all three of those were terrible decisions. And something we can do nowadays is revisit these questions. We can have amendments. Uh, one question I would like to see revisited is should Supreme Court terms be 14 or 18 years instead of unlimited life terms? And it's easier to think about this once you realize that this stuff was a bunch of guys sitting around on hot days in Philadelphia, making it up and then going out for a beer. You know, they sat and had a discussion one day. How many people should be in the president? Should the president be one person, two people or three people? And after a while, somebody says, you know, when the Romans had a triumvirate, it didn't work real well. They all fought with each other. They said, okay, the presidency will be one person. Then they said, well, who should impeach the president? Should it be the Supreme Court or should it be Congress? They decide Congress. But they were making it up and we can make it up too. Should big states have more senators than small states? Now they made a decision, no. But when they made that decision, the biggest state, Virginia, was 12 times the size of the smallest state, Delaware. Now California 
is a multiple of that, the size of Wyoming. So should we think about big states having three senators, the middle third having two senators, and the littlest states having one senator? So there are things we can think about. Okay, back to you, Hannah. So here's a historical one. Um, Steve asks, what was Washington's reaction to Shays' rebellion? I think Washington, like a lot of Southerners, was shocked by Shays' rebellion. Uh, the idea of rebellion uh, by the people was very scary, especially to Southerners, because it had a whiff of slave rebellion to it. And Southerners were terrified of slave rebellions. Um, Shays' rebellion, for those who haven't read their American history in the last five minutes. Uh, it's after the revolution, people in Western Massachusetts, soldiers especially come back and they find they're unable to pay their taxes because they haven't been paid for their service in the revolution. And so they start losing their land. So they get together and say, let's shut down the courts. So the governor of Massachusetts calls out the National Guard or the state militia and half the militia sides with the, re the rebels. Uh, so then the governor of Massachusetts forms a private militia uh, and has that paid for by the rich people. And they go down and put, out the put down the rebellion in Western Massachusetts. James Madison is watching this and says, you know, this proves the Articles of Confederation government isn't working. And he gets people like Washington to agree, we need to put aside the Articles of Confederation replace it with a stronger central government with a, a new constitution. And that's what they do. I think Madison kind of liked the Shays Rebellion because it gave him the example he needed of why they needed to change things. And he was able to talk people like Washington into that. Um, here's one from Lonnie. Uh, based on your research for your book, what would you recommend for our educational system to get back to first principles? Well, I'd like to hear from you, Lonnie, but I believe in uh, rigor, uh, rigorous education, uh, really engaged uh, ed education. Uh, I also think we should be much more flexible in our education. I think a lot of teenagers, especially teenage males, are not ready to learn. I think we should allow them to drop out for a couple, couple of years and have them wait, give them ways to come back. Uh, I find the people in their 20s, having stubbed their toes a few times, made some mistakes, are often much more interested in learning than, than teenagers are. Lonnie, do you have any, do you have a solution for our, our educational problems? Yeah, being at the, uh, at an educational institution currently, I, I see and echo some of your comments there about even the young, the young gentlemen who, some of them are not ready to go to school. Um, so that's kind of interesting. Um, but I would say just reading. Lots of reading. Yeah. I know even from my military career, the emphasis on reading and reading a lot and being known to be well read is very important um, to have any type of intellectual conversation with anybody. You, you got to have a basis, a strong foundation. So I, I would encourage everyone on this call and more likely than not, they're all a bunch of readers on here. So well, you're preaching I, to the library here. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but so, I, I agree reading. with you. I think reading is key. It really struck me. Um, I did a, a conversation with James Mattis uh, that uh, is on the Politics and Prose Bookstore website that goes, goes into this. James Mattis, Mattis, a general, Marine Corps general, later Secretary of Defense, famously had a personal library of 7,000 volumes. And uh, I remember asking Mattis once, and I think it was in Iraq, I was kind of interested in ancient Roman history then. And I said, um, what book should I read about Hannibal? And he said, well, what aspect of Hannibal are you interested in? Which is a, an interesting response from a general in the field. James Mattis, by the way, uh, always had in his rucksack when he went to war, the meditations of Marcus Aurelius, the uh, Roman emperor and Stoic philosopher. And I asked him why. He said, because I tried to get my mind out of the battlefield. Uh, at least for a few minutes every day. And if I take out the Marcus Aurelius, it takes me to another spot. Yeah, so I, I think reading is great. Back to you, Hannah. All right, here's uh, something from Jane. She says, 
I've spent many vacations going to Colonial Williamsburg to listen to the actors, historical figures. Uh, it has been very enlightening to learn about the Founding Fathers. Do you feel that we have become a country for elitists at the expense of the common man or middle class? Yes, I do. But more importantly, uh, John Adams warned about this. John Adams uh, wrote that America should be a country with a big middle class. He said, too much wealth is not good for anybody. Poverty is not good for anybody. I would like to see the money in the middle. And as I said earlier, I think we are in danger of becoming an oligarchy with democratic trappings, rule by the rich, control of politics by the rich, with looking like we have elections, but not really if money outweighs votes or if money can drive votes in a way it does these days. So yeah, I think we should revisit some of the provisions of the constitution like general welfare, and we need to be careful about the 1% taking all new wealth as they have been for the last 20 years in this country, all new increases in economic productivity while the middle class is flatlined for the last 30 years. David asks, tell us more about who Cincinnatus was and what role he played in thoughts about the early government and society. This is an easy question because Cincinnatus is, um, there's almost nothing known about him. So I, I can tell you in 30 seconds, Cincinnatus is a mythical early Roman general, early, early in Roman history. Supposedly a war starts and the Roman army is almost defeated. Cincinnatus is a retired general and the Roman, the, the leaders of the city go out to him and say, we need you to take command of the army. He leaves his plow, literally in the field, goes off, fights a big battle, wins the war, and then returns to his waiting plow. Why is Cincinnati important? Because there are several models for George Washington in his career. As I said before, Cato, the Roman politician was the one. Uh, another is Fabius, a Roman general who defeated Hannibal through indirect means. He refused to give Hannibal battle. Uh, he knew he just wanted to keep his army alive and eventually Hannibal would have to give up and he did. Uh, then there's the model of Cincinnatus, the Roman general who gives up power. Matt, uh, Washington does this not once, but twice in his career. At the end of the revolution, uh, Washington says, I'm giving up power. I'm resigning my commission as a general. I'm heading back to my farm. King George III supposedly said, if he's really doing that, he is the greatest man in the world. And then George Washington is elected president. And after two terms, he says, that's it, I'm out of here. The great man is stepping down and going back to his farm. Uh, and again, giving up power and providing a role model for people's behavior. There's a, a nice moment in American history at the inauguration of John Adams to replace Washington in 1797. At the end of the ceremony, they're leaving the room and Adams kind of defers to Washington as the most honored person there, he should leave the room first. And Washington says, no, you leave the room first, you're the president now. What I like about Washington is he puts flesh on the bones of the constitution. There are a lot of things that are laws, there are other things that are just norms. And he establishes a lot of norms about how a president should behave, dignified, reserved, serve two terms and then get out of there turn over power gracefully to your successor. And other presidents have not always followed those norms. Franklin Roosevelt breaks the two terms norm during World War II. And Donald Trump comes in, not knowing the constitution and not obeying a lot of those norms. One of the things we might consider these days, are there some things that we have treated as norms that we should now make more strictly laws? For example, if you have lost a presidential election, at what point should you admit it and turn over the reins of power gracefully to your successor to do what is best for the country? Uh, I could easily see a constitutional amendment that said once the, the victor is clear through the number of electoral votes as certified by the states, you must initiate transition procedures. Uh, 
Um, Judy asked another education related question. Should we go back to including more classical education in our current curriculum in schools? One thing I really like about America, and this is, I think, the genius partly of James Madison, power is dispersed across this country. Madison comes in and says, I'm going to make it so no one can just run things like they want. The power is dispersed between the states and the federal government, within the federal government, between three co-equal co branches, the judiciary, the executive, and the legislative. In the legislative branch, power is dispersed between two houses of the legislative branch. And power is dispersed between the states and the federal government. In the states, power is dispersed through all these counties. This is all to the point because the educational system is enormously decentralized in this country. That's a good thing, it's a democratic thing. And people spoke about this in the early 19th century. People took the idea of the we the people and they ran with it. America became very democratic very quickly and they got away from this elite thing about classical education. They didn't care about reading Greek and Latin. They wanted to know how to get their own land, to make their own family, raise their own families and educate them the way they wanted. And I think that's a good thing that uh, people make decisions about their own families, communities and so on. So I'm not gonna tell people what to learn, but yeah, reading American history would be a big help because right now a lot of people seem ignorant of both our laws and our history. And Bill asks, what do you think are the key freedoms that need to be defended for all US citizens today? The key freedoms, uh, first of all, uh, freedom of speech, um, freedom of association. And the most important freedom is embodied in the vote. The vote is the basic building block of democracy. Nothing is more important in voting than voting in creating what this country is. And so I'm very offended by people who attack or undermine trust in the system of voting. I think it's a smear on the American system, a smear on, to say that our election was fraudulent when there's no evidence, when 50 judges have considered it and thrown it out. So it was really brought home to me. The other day I was reading um, about Congressman John Lewis, who in his youth was a civil rights leader. Many years later, he's in Congress and he runs into a Congressman from Mississippi, Sonny Montgomery. And Sonny Montgomery, it turned out when the Freedom Riders, people demonstrating against segregation and against states refusing to obey a Supreme Court ruling desegregating buses as they traveled around the country. So he's a Freedom Rider, he's coming into Mississippi and the Mississippi National Guard gets on the bus with their bayonets uh, fixed to their weapons. The commander of the National U Guard unit that got on the bus that John Lewis was on was a young officer named Sonny Montgomery. I bring this up because years later, they're both in Congress and uh, Representative Montgomery turns to Representative Lewis and says, you know, I was in the National Guard on the bus you were on when you came into Mississippi riding for freedom. And Lewis says, well, you're a lot friendlier now. And Montgomery says, well, your people didn't have the vote back then. There's nothing more important than voting for this country. Um, here's a question from Karen and Mark. With our country so divided, how do you envision an amendment to the constitution could be approved? Well, it depends what you what sort of changes you want to make and also the amount of money that corporations would throw in defeating an amendment. Uh, look at the difficulty they've had in, in passing an amendment for equal rights for women. There's no amendment in the constitution on that. Um, I think a constitutional amendment that overturned Citizens United and says we've got to get money out of politics would be incredibly helpful. I think it would be difficult, but look, change can occur. Uh, I've been reading recently a lot about the civil rights movement and I'm really struck at how quickly the civil rights movement in 10 years changed the basic operation of this country in dealing with black people in getting segregation, which had been the law of the land, totally overturned getting public accommodations and getting voting rights. It's really striking 
Selma, Alabama, where John Lewis is clubbed by the police as he walks over a demonstration, along with hundreds of other people. The state police literally riding horses over women lying on the ground who had been knocked over. They were being clubbed by um, people have, uh, some of the police have rubber hoses wrapped in, in, barbecue, in um, barbed wire. And they were clubbing them. Six years later, the sheriff in that county was black. Why? Because of the Voting Rights Act and because people were finally allowed to register to vote and to exercise the vote. And that really changed the politics of the South. So I think we can make changes in this country, but you got to want it. Um, should, I finish, should I finish up by just buzzing through a couple of questions here? Uh, yeah, sure. Time. We've got, I, we've got actually quite a few still <laughs> that people have been tossing out there. Uh, we can do like a speed round. Okay, here's a speed round. The Wool Durant quote from Rob Cushman, a nation is born stoic and dies up a curian. I hadn't heard that. Uh, that's a good quote though, that's interesting. Um, when did statesmen turn into politicians, asked Lois Simons. I think there always were politicians, um, but great crises will develop statesmen. George Washington probably would have just been one more tongue-tied Virginia farmer had the American Revolution not come along. Um, Thomas Jefferson would have just been a wine-loving lawyer in Charlottesville had the revolution not come along. Um, so the times, the times will create the people. Uh, but man, you got to kind of worry where the statesmen are now. I mean, where are the people who are willing to put country before party right now? What effect did the Enlightenment have on the founding fathers, asked Barbara. Huge. I have a lot in the book about uh, the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment is basically the period in the 18th century people sometimes call the age of reason. Uh, it has an emphasis on a new way of thinking, on finding evidence for reasoned debate and coming to conclusions based on facts and evidence. In the course of this, uh, Montesquieu, the French philosopher, basically invents the modern liberal democratic state, a state based on tolerance, no slavery, uh, a balance of between justice and order and div division of power broadly to force people that if they're gonna make any sort of progress, they have to have compromises, they have to form alliances, they have to cut deals. The Scottish Enlightenment heavily influenced by Montesquieu becomes enormously important to the new Americans. Uh, the Scottish Enlightenment amazes me. In, in just a few decades, Scots invent economics, modern economics with Adam Smith, demography, sociology, geology, a much more important field than people realize as conception of the age of the earth, uh, history through Gibbons and, and to a degree, uh, Darwin's theory of evolution comes out of this. At the same time, James Watt coming out of this invents the steam engine and begins the industrial revolution, which has reshaped the earth for good and bad. These Scots, a lot of poor young men graduate from these cheap universities at Edinburgh and Glasgow, hop a cheap ride on tobacco ships and wind up in Virginia, especially teaching young men like Thomas Jefferson and James Madison. So there's this direct line from the ancient world, which Montesquieu wrote a lot about, to Montesquieu, to Scotland, to early America. Enlightenment's incredibly important and a lot of fun once you get past the difficulty of defining it. Um, how in the world did we win the Revolutionary War as a Confederation government? That's a great question from Steve. Is it pronounced Rideout or Rideau? Um, Steve's question, it is amazing we won the revolution. Uh, there is no particular reason we should have. We were very lucky had George Washington uh, been replaced and early on there was a chance he would have been, we probably wouldn't have won it. Uh, I think Washington's genius as a general is underrated. He begins as a very conventional general, much like the British officers he's facing. 
who wants to do conventional offensives, um, attack the enemy, and it doesn't work real well. He gets kicked out of Long Island, he gets chased across Manhattan, and then chased across New Jersey. And by late 1776, he's beginning to think he's gonna lose this war. But he's fairly young at the time, 44 years old, and he begins changing, he begins adjusting. He stops trying to be an offensive general. Remember I mentioned Fabius earlier, the Roman general, he adopts what's called a Fabian strategy. Don't try to engage the enemy. Instead, nibble away at his supply lines, at his foraging parties. Uh, don't get into big battles, but our, battles only happen occasionally. Armies have to eat every day. So even after he gets kicked out of New York and across New Jersey, in New Jersey, the militia keeps chewing away on the British. And in the six months after being evicted from New York, they whittle away half the British army from about 34,000 to about 16,000 through skirmishing, ambushes, and disease, desertion, and whatever else happens to the soldiers in the field. Uh, and that's what keeps the American army alive is the militia pushing the British around, uh, but not really fighting battles with them. We come out of that and Washington really hated the Articles of Confederation system. And I think that's one reason he was so receptive to Madison and others who said, let's write a new constitution. Okay, how are we doing on time, Hannah? Uh, I mean, we can probably one, hit one or two more questions. I okay. saw one that'll probably be quick for you. Someone was asking if you have a recommended biography of Madison. Yeah, my favorite biography of Madison is not one of the best known ones. Uh, there are some big ones by academics. The one I really like is by Richard Brookheiser, uh, B-R-O-O-K-H-I-S-E-R. -E and I, Brookheiser is a conservative thinker, uh, writes for the National Review, a conservative magazine. But I really liked it because Madison, first and foremost, is a politician. And I don't think academics really understand politics that well, but Brookheiser has a feel for politics and it really informs the biography. It's also pretty short. Uh, there are some other biographies of Madison, but that's the one I went back to a lot, really, when I was trying to understand Madison. Uh, some of the things also that uh, Gordon Wood at Brown, a terrific historian, has written about Madison are kind of interesting. No one book about Madison, but actually, Gordon Wood had a very good article in the New York Review of Books uh, about Madison about 20 years ago that I, that I quote in the book. Okay, uh, last question. Are there any two-handers that if I don't answer them, people are going to go home mad? Well, Nancy asked one that I think might be interesting to end on. She says, uh, what do you think of changing the Electoral College to reflect better the popular vote? I think it's not an all or nothing question. Some people just say, let's get rid of the Electoral College. The Electoral College has been one of the many shock absorbers that Madison wrote into the Constitution. And we could get rid of it. And I think there's a good argument for that. We also could change the structure somewhat. As I said, if the big states had three senators and the smallest states had one senator, uh, that would change the Electoral College vote and would much reduce uh, the influence of that vast empty chunk of America north of Texas and west of the Mississippi that has uh, as many electoral votes as California, but has a fraction of the population. And I think it is undemocratic. But before you change things, you wanna ask about unintended side effects. One thing I've been thinking about this week that has really struck me was the genius in making the states responsible for national elections. You think, you know, well, you're in the federal government, shouldn't the federal government run it? But to watch Donald Trump flailing around, looking for a toehold, looking for a way to, uh, to invalidate the election. And state after state has said, nope, this was clean. Nope. And the judges look at it and say, nope, you know. So state judges, uh, state secretaries of state, this whole state system has shown an interesting strength here and I think an unexpected value that had never occurred to me until this week. That takes care of our time. Thank you very much. This is wonderful. And once again, thanks to the Blue Hill Library for keeping us alive and getting us through the winter. Thank you, Tom.
Um, I want to invite everyone, if 